Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on an introduction to Friedman's ANOVA. As always, if you find this video to be helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. I certainly appreciate it. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. And sometimes we hear the Friedman's ANOVA referred to as the Friedman's Analysis of Variance by Ranks. It's also known as Friedman's Test. Friedman's ANOVA is a non-parametric test, also known as a distribution-free test. And it does involve repeated measures. So we use Friedman's ANOVA when we have three or more measures over time or three or more experimental conditions. So I'll provide an example of each of these. So three or more measures over time, you could think of this as in a research study at a mental health agency. And you have participants coming in to be treated for depression. So participants come in to outpatient treatment, they're treated, their treatment ends, and before they leave the agency, the day their treatment ends, they're given a psychometric instrument designed to measure depression levels. Six months later, those same participants come back and take that same measure, that same psychometric instrument. A year after treatment ends, again the participants return and take that same test. So you have one test the day the client is being discharged, a test six months later, and a test six months after that. So you have, in that case, three measures, it's the same measure over time and the same participants. So now for an example of the three or more experimental conditions. So imagine you're at this mental health agency and you're conducting a research study and you have a particular achievement test. And you're concerned that distractions could affect the outcome based on the way the test is designed or what it's measuring. There's some reason to be concerned that distractions could be an issue. So you have a participant participant comes in and takes this achievement test in a room alone. So theoretically distraction free. The participant is alone in the room and takes the achievement test. Later on with that same participant you readminister that achievement test except in this instance you have another individual in the room and that would cause some level of distraction. The same participant comes back into that same room, takes that same test a third time, except this third time, you have four other participants in the room. So one condition in this repeated measures allows for no distractions. The second condition, one person be in the room, so that's some level of distraction. And the third condition, four other people being in the room. So that would be the greatest level of distraction. Same participants, same achievement test, but you are manipulating an independent variable in this case, and that is the level of distraction. That's the experimental condition. Now, when we think of the design of Friedman's ANOVA, it seems pretty similar to a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. And Friedman's ANOVA is an alternative to one-way repeated measures ANOVA. We might choose to use a Friedman's ANOVA instead of one-way repeated measures ANOVA in two circumstances. One is where we have violated the assumptions for a univariate ANOVA. So the data violate the assumptions of normality or of homogeneity of variances, but we can no longer use either way univariate ANOVA. The other instance would be where the ordinal level of measurement is used for the dependent variable. Univariate ANOVA can only be used with an interval or ratio level of measurement for the dependent variable, not the ordinal level. Friedman's ANOVA will accept the ordinal level of measurement. So if the Friedman's ANOVA is more flexible and it can do the same thing, why wouldn't we use it instead of univariate ANOVA in every instance? And that comes down to the concept of statistical power. Statistical power is the ability to detect a difference that's actually there. 
and the parametric ANOVA, univariate ANOVA, that has more power than Friedman's ANOVA. If the data violate the assumptions for parametric ANOVA and you end up using Friedman's ANOVA, you can still test the data, but you do lose some statistical power in that trade-off. The same thing for using the ordinal level measurement for a dependent variable. Friedman's ANOVA will still allow you to test the null hypothesis. However, there is a loss of statistical power. The null hypothesis for Friedman's ANOVA is that the sum of the ranks of the groups are equal. And when we test this null hypothesis with three or more measures, or three or more experimental conditions, we end up in the same situation as we do with a parametric ANOVA. We need to use a post hoc test because if we get a statistically significant p-value, that is one less than 0.05 in most cases in the social sciences, we don't know where the difference is. So consider the example I used earlier with the no distraction condition and the one-person distraction and the four-person distraction. If we run a Friedman's ANOVA with those data and we get a statistically significant result, we know there's a difference there. We know the sum of the ranks of the groups are not equal. However, we do not know where that difference is located. Is that difference between the no distraction and the one-person distraction, the no distraction and the four-person distraction, or between the one-person distraction and the four-person distraction. We don't know. There's three pairwise comparisons, and we only know from the result of Friedman's ANOVA that there's a difference somewhere. It requires a post hoc test to find out exactly where. And the post hoc test for Friedman's ANOVA would be a Wilcoxon signed rank test. The Wilcoxon signed rank test is similar to Friedman's ANOVA, except it only uses two measures over time or two experimental conditions. That makes it ideal to be used as a post hoc test for Friedman's ANOVA because we're only making pairwise comparisons. When you use a Wilcoxon sign rank test as a post hoc test for Friedman's ANOVA, it's important to remember that this would cause a type 1 error rate inflation. The type 1 error rate is the probability that we will reject the null hypothesis when it was actually true. So we're going to say there's a difference between the groups when there was no difference. That's a type 1 error. Because we have three pairwise comparisons, we need to adjust that alpha of 0 0.05 to prevent an inflation of that type 1 error rate. One fairly common way to do this is through a Bonferroni correction. And with a Bonferroni correction, you take the alpha, in this case 0 0.05, and divide it by the number of tests. In this case, it would be three, three pairwise comparisons. So 0 0.05 divided by three is approximately 0 0.017. That would become the alpha that we compare the probability value to for each of the three Wilcoxon sign rank tests that are performed. Now let's take a look at the elements of Friedman's ANOVA. So with Friedman's ANOVA, you have one independent variable. You have three or more related groups. So with that one independent variable, you could think of that as three or more levels. This is a within subjects design, not a between subjects design. So with Friedman's ANOVA, you're using the same participants throughout all the assessments. So the same participants are being repeatedly measured. Now let's take a look at the elements of a Friedman's ANOVA. So for Friedman's ANOVA, you need one independent variable and one dependent variable. The independent variable needs to have three or more related groups or three or more levels. So with the example of testing participants after treatment at discharge, six months later, and six months after that, the independent variable would be time, just the amount of time that lapsed between the measures. So each level of that independent variable would be a different time, at discharge, six months later, and a year after discharge. 
In the example with the achievement test and the level of distraction, the independent variable would be the level of distraction. That's the experimental variable that's being manipulated. So that would be no distraction, one person distraction, and four person distraction. Those would represent three levels of the independent variable distraction. So again, Friedman's ANOVA uses a within subjects design. The same participants receive all the levels or conditions of the independent variable. So all of the participants are tested at discharge six months later and a year after discharge in the first example, and all the participants take the achievement test in the three levels, no distraction, one person distraction, and four person distraction. It's a within subjects design. Friedman's ANOVA also requires one dependent variable. And this is similar to parametric ANOVA. Parametric ANOVA can accept one dependent variable with the interval or ratio level measurement. With Friedman's ANOVA, we add ordinal to that. So it can accept ordinal, interval, and ratio. So this is one of the ways that it's a little more flexible than a parametric univariate ANOVA. So what are these levels of measurement? So you can see here we have ordinal, interval, and ratio. So the only level of measurement missing here would be nominal. A nominal level of measurement is in name only. So for example, where the participants come in to take the achievement test, if you gather the city or town that the participant was from as part of that research design, that would be at the nominal level. It's still information, and it may be useful information, but there's no way to rank a city or town. The ordinal level of measurement is one step up. With an ordinal level of measurement, you can rank the data. So for example, if you had some sort of contest and a participant could come in first, second, third, fourth place, but you didn't know the distance between when they finished. You didn't know how much time elapsed between first place and second place. That would be an ordinal level of measurement. You can rank the observations, but there's no meaningful distance between them. Another example of a collection method that's used at the ordinal level of measurement is the Likert scale. For example, you could have a five-point Likert scale, and the first item could be strongly disagree, the second item disagree, the third item no opinion, the fourth item agree, and the fifth item strongly agree. Most of the time, Likert scales are treated at the ordinal level of measurement. There are some instances where Likert scales are treated as an interval level of measurement, and there's some debate over whether that should be done or not. A better case can be made to use a Likert scale as an interval level of measurement if you can demonstrate there is a meaningful distance between the observations. And another element that would help would be increasing the number of observations on the Likert scale. For example, a seven-point Likert scale or a nine-point Likert scale, with all other factors being equal, would be better candidates to be considered interval than a five-point Likert scale. The next level moving up would be the interval level of measurement. And the interval level of measurement, you have a meaningful distance between the observations, but you do not have a true zero. So a good example of this would be the Fahrenheit temperature scale. There is a meaningful distance between those observations, and you do have a zero on the Fahrenheit temperature scale, but it's not a true zero. It doesn't represent an absence of the construct the scale is measuring in this case, heat. For the ratio level measurement, this has all the characteristics of the interval level measurement, except it does have a true zero. So using the example with temperature, the Kelvin scale, you have a meaningful distance between the observations, and the zero represents an absence of heat. So again, with Friedman's ANOVA, one dependent variable, it can be measured at the ordinal, interval, or ratio level of measurement and one independent variable that has three or more related groups. Now moving on to the assumptions for Friedman's ANOVA. So with all statistics, you have assumptions that you need to meet prior to performing this, the statistic. 
we want to make sure that the data meet the assumptions so that the results of the statistic will be accurate. Non-parametric statistics, distribution-free statistics, typically do not have as many assumptions as parametric statistics. And Friedman's ANOVA is a good example of this. Other than the items I have already mentioned, the one independent variable and the one dependent variable, Friedman's ANOVA only has two more assumptions. You need to have a random sample and you need to have a minimum of 12 participants. Unlike a one-way repeated measures ANOVA, Friedman's ANOVA does not have an assumption of normality. The dependent variable does not need to be normally distributed. I hope you found this introduction to Friedman's ANOVA to be useful. Thanks for watching.